Hello and welcome to the Despreneur Podcast. My name is Thomas Lornavichis, I'm the founder of Despreneur, and I'll be your host. In this show, I'll connect and talk with top designers, successful entrepreneurs, and tech visionaries. The goal of this podcast is to unlock your potential and help you build a successful business and live with purpose. So hello and welcome to the very first episode, and today I'm having Paul Jarvis who has been a freelancer for over 20 years. He's a best-selling author, blogger, podcaster, and educator. Paul recently launched Chimp Essentials, a class that teaches you how to make MailChimp work for your business. So welcome to the, welcome to the show, Paul. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Thanks for having me on. How are you today? I am good. We have such a big time difference, but I'm glad that we were able to uh, sort out when it worked. Yeah, I hope we don't hear too many of these geckos around me. <laughs> All right, so can you tell me more about your, your latest email, email course? Yeah, so basically I wanted, because I've used MailChimp for a long time, and because that's like, honestly, MailChimp is the reason I make money with my business is because I have a mailing list. So I found myself answering questions from people all the time about MailChimp or correcting people's ideas about what they thought MailChimp did or didn't do. So I figured I would just make a course because it, it comes down to this, like, Having a MailChimp account, you have to pay for, you unless you have a free account. But if you have more than 2,000 subscribers or you want to use automation, you have to pay for it. But what I want people to do is instead of having to pay for MailChimp, I want them to know how to use MailChimp to make them money so they make more than they spend on MailChimp. Because for me personally, for every dollar I spend on MailChimp, I make about $120. So I figured that I would make a course that teaches kind of all of the technical things that I do that aren't actually all that technical. They don't require programming or anything. It's just really a matter of setting up smart automation sequences and creating segment so that you're sending the right emails to the right people at the right time. Yeah, sounds awesome. And, and the course is available for free, right? A couple of like uh, chapters and then you have the, the premium. Yeah, exactly. There's uh, free lessons. There's six free lessons. And I actually suggest people sign up for those first. Don't buy the course right away. Sign up for the free lessons first. See if it's something that see if my teaching style works for you. If it does, great. You can buy the full course. If not, then you didn't spend any money and you, you got to check out some, uh, some cool lessons for free. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I remember you, you released uh, your own like self-paced email course uh, like a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. So is it, is it like a follow-up or, or you completely redesigned it? Yeah, it's sort of that on steroids. Like I wrote an article um, for Smashing Magazine about how to set up um, an, an automated email course. And this is when MailChimp first came out with automation. And since then, they've kind of improved it a whole lot. They've got all sorts of features that you can do with groups and segments and post sending things. And it's just basically taking all of the things that I know because my background is programming and design and applying those things in a non-programming way to all of the things that I do with content marketing. So being a, a bootstrapped indie product maker person, I have to basically promote my own stuff. And what I found is that email is the easiest and best and most fun way to promote my own stuff. So I just really wanted to share with people how that how they can do similar without spending money on ads. Like I've spent money on ads, dude. Like I spent last year I tried uh, Facebook ads and Google ads. I think I spent about four grand over two months with ad experts. And I think I made $400 back, which is kind of crappy. Like it, <laughs> yeah, it, it was the worst return on investment ever. But like I said, with MailChimp, for every buck I spend, I make 120 bucks, which is a ridiculously amazing return on investment. So yeah, I just figured that using, and it just feels more like me. Like it feels more like my brand. I like communicating with my mailing list. They're obviously all people that want to get emails from me. Otherwise they wouldn't sign up or they would unsubscribe. So it just feels like a, a nicer and more effective and a more like me kind of way to communicate with my audience. It's just to, to write them, write them emails and write them articles that I share through my newsletter. Yeah, I totally agree that email is one of the greatest, and great, one of the greatest platforms. But what do you think about like other platforms, social media, and like there's like always like a new platform going out, and everyone's just talking. You know, you should jump on Snapchat, you should jump on Periscope, you should jump on this and that. What do you think about other channels? 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't think I see those as sort of um, auxiliary brand awareness channels. And I mean, I've tried some. I haven't tried all of them. Like, I've never had a Facebook account. I've never had a LinkedIn account either. I think LinkedIn is the biggest piece of shit ever. (laughs) But that's just my personal opinion. But so I think social and all of these new networks are great places to remind people of your brand and to remind people what you do. But when I look at my own conversion rates, like if I tweet about my course, I get maybe a 1% uh, return on investment. So if I tweet it, maybe one person out of however many followers, like I think I have maybe 18,000 followers, maybe one person will buy it. But if I send an email to about the same number of people, if I send an email to about 18,000 people, then I'll probably sell a couple hundred copies of my course. So it's like night and day. But I think social is good. To, because I can't email people four or five times a day. That would be ridiculous. Everybody would leave my mailing list. But I can talk on social a couple times a day, and people kind of get a sense of who I am, how I'm kind of weird, the things that I make, all of that sort of thing. And then when I send them an email, they remember who I am because I've been engaging with them on social. But then email is just a, a much easier, better, and more effective way to get them to go from... Uh, somebody interested in my brand or interested in my products to a paid customer, which is ultimately ultimately the goal if you're selling products, I think. Yeah, I think the, the main idea is about like domesticating your subscribers. So maybe you can, you can go through your, your own process. What, what, what did you use at the very beginning? When, when did you create your first email list? Was it uh, like 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago? What did you do at that time? And uh, how do you act differently right now? Okay, so... I was looking at the Wayback Machine, um, like archive.web, whatever it is, the Wayback Machine, is scary. Like I was looking at one of my very first websites that I think, my first company website when I first started doing web design on my own. I think it was probably in the late 90s. And I had a mailing list on that site. And that would email me. I would save that person's name in a spreadsheet and then copy and paste those email addresses. Like there wasn't e- there wasn't any really good email software back then. There were there wasn't really newsletter software, so I would just email people from a spreadsheet. And I you could only email twenty people at a time. So if I had a hundred people on my list, I had to cut and paste into five emails all of their emails and send them emails, which is ridiculous and it's a lot of work. But when I first started to take mailing lists seriously was probably about four years ago. And the first email that, and that was my Sunday dispatches list. That's when it started. And the first email that I sent went out to about 60 people. Like it was almost nothing. And for the first four or five months, I probably had 100, maybe 150 people on my mailing list. But I kept at it. I kept creating content as often as possible. I stuck to a schedule. I was consistent. I talked to my audience. I found out what they wanted to know about. And then it grew and it grew and it grew from there. Yeah, I see. So I'm, I'm very curious about the fact that you're actually a maker, you're a designer and you, you like to create things. So how did you how did you see email marketing at the beginning? Because uh, personally, I don't see it as a very glamorous thing to do um, when you're you know designer. So how did you how did you how did you take it and uh, what did you learn about it? Yeah, I realized that when I was just a designer, I used my mailing list in a very different way. So when I was just doing freelance design work for clients, I would use it to keep in touch with my clients, let them know about new launches, let them know about my availability, because I found when I did that, I could level out the ebbs and flows of work. So I wouldn't have like a hundred people asking for work one month and then nobody asking for work the next month, I could kind of keep them up to date on my schedule. But then when I transitioned from client-based work to product-based work, I realized that I could make the best thing in the world, but if nobody knew about it, nobody was going to buy it. And I'm not the best salesperson. Like I would rather make things and sell things. But I found that the more that I communicated with my mailing list, the more I didn't really even have to sell them. I could just write because I'm a, I write every day anyways. If I just wrote them an article every week and shared it with them, and then once or twice a year when I released a product, if I told them, hey, this product that I've been working on that I've probably mentioned a few times in this newsletter is now available, I didn't really have to sell it to them. I could just let them know that it was available, and then they would buy it in, in droves, and that would be enough to support me 
and my business basically is just communicating with them throughout the year. And then once or twice a year when I release something, letting them know, and then I didn't really have to sell. I could just talk about the things that I liked to make and talk about the, the topics that I wanted to write about. So I write anyway, so it didn't, didn't really feel like work to me. All right. So it sounds like all the gurus would say like, just do what you love and the money will come, right? <laughs> Something like that. I completely believe the opposite, but <laughs> I think that I think if you find a, a business case for doing something that you don't mind and you can like the work but not necessarily like the trappings of the work, then I think it's okay. So yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't write as much or spend as much time on my mailing list if it wasn't making me money because I wouldn't have time to make <laughs> I wouldn't have time to make money and I wouldn't be able to afford to like eat and pay for my mortgage <laughs> and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Uh, I was curious, how do you come up uh, with ideas for your products? Is it just like you have an idea for an article or you want, you want to express a thought and then, uh, then the, the product idea comes up or you just like uh, do a market research or you listen to your audience, what they are struggling with? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a bunch of everything. So I do a lot of <laughs> my, what I call market research is really just listening. So if I send an email, if I send my weekly email out to like thousands of people, I get hundreds of replies every Sunday. And so I can kind of start to see trends and what articles are really hitting home with people, what articles are falling flat, what people are interested in. And then from there, I can kind of get a general sense of what my audience is craving and what they really want and what they want to learn. And then from there, I can start... Um, kind of talking to them and figuring out like getting into one-on-one -on -one conversations with them either through Skype. Like I did that, the book that I wrote that sold the most copies with like a few more zeros on it in terms of number of sales compared to any of my books was a book that started from me talking on the phone to three dozen of my subscribers to my mailing list and just having like an open conversation about kind of what they were working on, where they were at and seeing what they wanted to know. And then from that, I developed that into a book with the, my course creative class, which now has, I don't know, like 2,200 students in it. Like it's, it's much bigger than I ever thought it would be. That started by me sending out surveys to freelancers that had paid for online courses in the past. So uh, it was people that I knew would spend money on online courses because it's an online course, as well as people who were in the industry that I wanted to target. And with mailing lists, it's easy. Like I just segmented out my list for those types of people. And then I sent them a quick survey on Typeform. And it was that really started the, the research for me. Yeah, sounds, sounds the, the way to go. And... What do you think about like, well, you are a freelancer, but I see you as a, as a design entrepreneur. And uh, as you know, like Despreneur is like for design entrepreneurship. And I wanted to ask you like, how do you automate your stuff? Because you're definitely not, not selling your hours that much anymore. You're trying to create systems and processes. And, and how do you go about it? Yeah, so I actually use, I'm such a huge fan of automation because I'm not a manager. I'm I'm not a delegator. I'm really good at doing things. I'm really bad at telling other people to do things for me. So my business is just me. So I run basically a one-person web design shop. I have, I think, five courses, five books, a SaaS application, two podcasts, <laughs> um, a couple other things on the go at all times. And the way that I kind of am able to do that without losing my mind or actually being able to sleep at night is by automating as much as possible. So all of the products that I sell, I don't have to do anything with them. So if somebody wants one of my products and they sign up for like the free lessons, then they'll get an automation sequence. But then if they purchase it during that free automation sequence, they'll get taken out of the free sequence and put into the paid sequence. So if they're taking say seven free lessons from creative class and they're on lesson two and they're like, this Paul guy knows what he's talking about. I'm just going to buy creative class. So then they don't get the rest of the free lessons they get start to get emails saying, thank you for buying the class. Here's how you use creative class and then check-ins with how they're doing with the lessons. 
So ev basically, every email that anybody ever gets from me, other than my Sunday dispatches, is all automation, which I have nothing to do with. Like, it just runs by itself. So it segments people based on their habits or their purchases and sends them specific information at the right time for the right person. And that's really, like, my business couldn't run. Like, I would need to hire people if I didn't have automation because it would take so long. Like, there's nothing I have to do when somebody signs up for a free product or a paid product unless there's a problem. And I can't remember the last time there was a problem <laughs> with anything that I do. So I would rather make the things and just have them work and sell instead of having to support them or hire like a VA or a support person. Like it just, that doesn't sound fun to me. Like that just doesn't sound like interesting work. I would rather be making stuff and then automate everything in MailChimp so they, the right people get the right emails at the right time. Yeah, sounds, sounds incredible. And I'm still like trying to figure out all of these things. So definitely taking, taking some time <laughs> to, to put aside uh, and then take your course to, to learn more about it. And probably you should, you should automate your, cool. your interviews. You do a lot of these podcasts and then a lot of shows. So <laughs> recently I was calling PayPal, uh, trying to, uh, to set up like a business account payments. And I got into like, uh, yeah. like this, you know, autoresponder, like robot talking to me. And then the robot says like, in your own words, <laughs> explain, what do you want? And I'm like, I need to set up my business. And he's like, do you want to change your address or, or like in other words explain what you need so like it took me like five minutes to figure out how to trick the robot to to, to get me to talk to to real person and then after after two two people uh like i had two real people i i was forwarded back to robot so i was like oh my god this loop is incredible <laughs> it's ridiculous but where automation makes sense is when you put your own personality into it so for example, when somebody signs up for my mailing list, my main mailing list, they get an email saying that I was so excited that they signed up for my mailing list. I went out and I got a tattoo of that person's name on my arm because I want to be reminded of the day that they signed up for my mailing list. And there's not a single person that has ever told me that that's like some automated robotic like marketing garbage. Everybody loves that email. But that's something that I never have to think about because it's automated. Same with the like paid or the free sequences that I do. I think automation is great, but you just have to be smart about it because you are making it so it's not coming from yourself, but you can still make it sound like yourself. You can still make it in your voice with your designs. And I see one good example of this is if you use MailChimp and you don't customize the sign-up process, so it just says your name. I see designers doing this too, and it really bugs me. Like where it's just like a, a plain gray background around a white box with a like name in Arial bold. It's like you can customize all of this. And this is the first experience that people have of your brand if they sign up for your mailing list. And you're showing them, if you don't customize it, that you don't give a shit. Whereas if you spent a little bit of time maybe tweaking the text to sound like you, maybe adding your actual logo, maybe adding the colors of your brand, then people are going to feel like you care about them enough to do these sort of things. And they will reciprocate that by listening, which is a good thing, or, or potentially eventually buying something from you. So I think automation by itself is silly. Automation with like putting a bit of thought behind it and putting a bit of your unique personality into it, I think is really, really, really helpful. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. And actually I, I feel sure. guilty myself not, not customizing these things because these are like little ugly things that take a lot of time and you're like, oh, I should just focus on, you know, more beautiful stuff. <laughs> but it really makes sense. And uh, I, I made a priority to really like focus on these ugly things now. So <laughs> trying to find myself like uh, some time to, to customize these things or find someone who can do that for me. Mm -hmm. So, so my next question would be, how, how do you make people to desire to be on your list? Because one of these tricks that you just mentioned is, is one of the way to, ways to go. But what are the, the other things to, to make people listen to you, as you say, and then uh, how to actually create that desire to be on your list? Yeah, so I think a lot of it comes down, like there's a lot of marketing people who will give you like the like 10 ways to get more subscribers. And I don't know, I think that's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. Like 
it's it can maybe work a little bit, but at the end of the day, to what I found, the biggest growth of my mailing list happens when I write a good article that my audience likes. So if I write, some, if I share something with my list, regardless of how it's designed, regardless of if there's freebies for signing up, regardless of the language, people will sign up. People will be more likely to sign up because somebody they know has shared my content. And I think with like growth hacking, which is a word I hate, but I think the way that audiences grow is when other people tell their audience about you. So it, if you start to think of it less from a like technical or like content upgrades, bonuses, all of that, like those things can work a little bit. But at the end of the day, if you're not sharing something with your audience that they really, really like, that they really, really enjoy, that they really, really find interesting, they're not even going to stick around. So even if you get a ton of signups and a ton of traction in your list, they're not going to stick around because they're not engaged or they're not interested. So what I do is I just vote, like, there's no freebie. Like, the, the message for signing up for my mailing list is you get my articles. That's it. Like, it, it, it's that simple. And instead, what I focus on is making sure that every article is as valuable and as funny or as interesting or is as useful as humanly possible because I get more signups when I write something that really hits home because then everybody on my list shares it with everybody they know and then other people sign up. Oh yeah, so, so you've been talking about like premium content and like showing real value and you've been contributing recently to many big uh, publications like King Forbes, Fast Company. How do you come, uh, come to, to get in touch with, with these companies and how do you get published on them? Yeah, so the, I'll, I'll answer that question then update that. So I, the way to write for big publications, like I, I actually tried this because I was curious and this was after I was already writing for a lot of big publications. I was like, I wonder if the submission form or the submission email works on all of these big publications. So I emailed a hundred publications and I said, hey, look, I write for Fast Company Inc., The Next Web. I was wondering if I can contribute an article to you. I heard back from one company, from one publication. And I wish I hadn't, because then it would have been like, I tried 100 and it failed 100%. But one publication contacted me and was like, yes, write for us. But so using those forms and using those like, e email your article tips or ideas to this email address, those go nowhere. Like, I'm pretty sure nobody ever reads those. So I don't think that works. What does work and what I found works for me and the reason why I have written for a lot of these publications is because I spend a lot of time talking to people. I network with people, even though I'm fairly introverted and I don't really like leave the house all that often. I still make it a point to interact with people. And every single publication that I've had a chance to write for is only because I got a personal intro from somebody who already wrote for that publication to their editor. And pretty much if that happens, I 100% guaranteed that I'm going to write for the publication. If somebody says like, hey, editor, this person, Paul Jarvis, who I've known for a while, who I talked to, is a really good writer. I think he would be a great fit for the publication. And pretty much 100% of the time, they're like, yeah, cool, let's do it. Whereas if you're sending an email to the like <laughs> submissions at Inc or whatever this, I don't know what their email address is, but that never, like that doesn't work. So I think people should spend time um, getting to know other writers at publications. And the other thing is it also doesn't work because I get emails probably a few times a week from people that I don't know saying, hey, can you introduce me to your editor at so-and-so publication? And it's like, why, why would I do that? Like, I don't know this person. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to just blindly ask other writers to get introductions because that's their reputation on the line. Whereas if it's somebody that I know who's writing, I've been reading for a while, somebody that I respect, then yeah, I'm definitely going to make that introduction. But just like person off the street that's sending an email to my inbox and it's the first time I've ever heard of them and they're asking me for something, I, don't, I would have no time left in my day if I just did things for people I don't know. I would rather do things for people that I do know that have spent time getting to know me and have developed relationships with me. So I think for that and pretty much for all business, it's, it's all about relationships. So being like a real person and being engaging with people that you know and people that you talk to, 
I think is is really important. It's just like with you, if you had reached out to me and said like the, our first contact had been like, hey, can you introduce me to so and so, or can I be on your podcast or something like that, I would have been like, I don't I don't know you, but like we've talked on the internet for a while, like we know who each other are, we've we've done things for each other, little things, and so there's like a relationship that's built, and I think that's really how how things need to work instead of just like reaching out to a hundred magazines or a hundred people you don't know and asking them for something. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really glad that you touched a uh, reputation topic because I, I truly believe like mm -hmm. loyalty and, and reputation and integrity is very important in business. And I was just curious about more of your selling tricks because I think, well, trick sounds like a very sketchy thing, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's definitely one of the, the biggest influencers for your like success and for your, uh, for your sales, your reputation. And I was just checking your uh, Chimp Essentials uh, course and you have these little, uh, let's say, urgency tricks like course registration closes in 21 days. You have uh, very nice uh, call to action buttons. So maybe you can, uh, you can talk about more, uh, more of these like selling tricks. Uh, sure. Because as, as you mentioned, the reputation is, is one of the most important ones, but what about these little tri tr tricky ones? Yeah, so the, the first thing is that I don't, I would never try to sell something that I don't 100% believe in, that I haven't. Like I've had 50 beta testers go through this course and give me feedback. If their feedback wasn't all positive, I wouldn't release it. So the things like, ur so urgency is the first one that I want to talk about. So urgency is important because if people say they're going to buy something from you later or do something later, it's never going to happen. Later on the internet means never. So you have to give them not just a reason to buy the thing that you've made, but you give them a reason to buy it now instead of later. So I have, a, this course is only available for 30 days. And I'm completely honest about it. It's only available for 30 days because MailChimp and WordPress and Zapier and all the other things that are in this course change their interface and change their features. Zapier actually changed their interface the day before I launched this and like two weeks after I filmed the lessons. So I, it's already a little bit out of sync, which bugs me, which means I'm going to probably this weekend record, re-record those lessons. So, and I tell people like in the free sequence, like this course closes at the end of March. I'm not just doing this to be a dick. I'm doing this because I need to make sure that all of the lessons match up with all of the software that I'm teaching. But still, it gives people, like, if you want this course, you have to sign up in the next 20 days as of, like, this recording sort of thing. So urgency, I, I think smart urgency and honest urgency is always a good thing. It's just like I for creative class, I had all of these evergreen discounts, so discounts that never expired. And people were using them, but not that much. And then I talked to one of my friends, and she was like, why do you have evergreen discounts? Like, oh, okay, your course is evergreen and that's fine. But why do the discounts never expire? And I was like, okay, let me test this. So I created um, some code that made the discounts expire 48 hours after people got them. And then I noticed my sales went up by a lot. So having urgency is always important, but not just fake urgency. Like people's bullshit meters are really, really good. Most of the time, people can tell your intentions whether you want them to or not. So trying to be dishonest with urgency always backfires. But being honest about urgency can definitely, definitely work. The other thing is that you want to build trust because people don't want, like, it's the internet, right? So people, before they open their wallets, they need to trust you. So doing things like testimonials, I like to do embedded tweets because a testimonial, you could fake. Like I've actually found at least six or seven websites that have my name, my face, and words from me on their site, me giving them a testimonial that I never, I've never seen their product before. I don't know who they are. So testimonials can kind of be fake, but I like to use Twitter. I like to use tweet embeds because if I'm embedding a tweet from somebody, that's a tweet that came from them. It's just like Amazon, verified Amazon reviews. It's like, you can't really fake that. So I like to do things like that. The other thing that I like to do is talk about the benefits instead of the features. And for a lot of technical people, we lean on, somebody should buy this for these technical reasons because it does this, this, and this. And that doesn't always, that doesn't always work. And when you think about the way that big companies do it, it kind of follows suit where, they sell you the outcome. So they sell you 
how good your life will be after you've made the purchase. And I think it's very, it's very honest because the reason I teach things, like the reason I teach Chimp Essentials is so that people will get better at MailChimp and make money with MailChimp. So if I'm showcasing the benefits, I'm going to be talking about what they can do with their business after they master the technical side of MailChimp, which is far more beneficial than saying just this is what this course does, this is what you're going to learn. It's kind of boring, it's kind of dry. The fourth thing, the final thing is personality. People buy from you because of some emotional connection. <clears throat> so if you're not showing your personality, your brand, your, what's unique about you, nobody's going to want to buy anything from you. It's just like I, my second book ever was an online business book. There's probably 100,000 online business books. If I didn't make it personable and unique and about my own stories and about my own opinions and my own two cents about the way things work, nobody would have bought it because it's really hard to build something that has no competition, but it's much easier to build something where competition can exist, but there's something very unique about the thing that you've made. So I think those are the, the most important things. And none of those, like I guess those could be called tricks, but they're all just things to pay attention to when you're trying to sell something to somebody. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, and I really like the, the personality one and uh, the books that I read from yours were, were really entertaining and like stories were, were so interesting. And it's not just, you know, you're saying you do this and do that. You were just going through your own story, your own failures and what you learned in them. So I really like the, the personality trick. And uh, well, one of the probably most memor memorable uh, personality like uh, uh, how do you say attribute of yours for me is like your your rats and your tattoos so if if I just see like uh, a little piece of it I would just uh, instantly uh, recognize that it's it's Paul Jarvis and, and your brand so I really like all of these like uh, humor and, and and your your own like personality in your products yeah thank you and I think that's probably one of the main reasons why it's funny because people tell me like I I want to have personality, but I want to make money. So I don't want to. And people, when money's involved, they're like, uh, I'll show my personality later. Whereas what I found is if I show my personality, even when money's on the table, when I'm trying to sell something or trying to get a client, it only helps. Like it, it always works to my benefit by just being like a real honest human being. Yeah, that's absolutely, absolutely true. And when I started, I was doing a big mistake. I was uh, always trying to, to hide my own age, my own face, my own, uh, you know, real name and like my skills and whatever, yeah. just to, you know, sound like oh, I'm this serious designer, you should hire me. So, <laughs> so it's, it's really good to, to learn from people like you. And uh, one of the last questions uh, from me, so uh, I don't want to, to keep you all day. Uh, what's, what's coming next for you? Um, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like Chimp Essentials closes March 31st. And then my schedule, I don't do client work anymore. So my schedule is 100% open as of April 1st, which I kind of like because what I was doing previously is I would plan things like months and months in advance. And then it would come to that time. And then I wouldn't be excited about the thing I'd planned. And then I would just procrastinate. So now I just kind of leave it open. So I'll figure out what I'm doing past April 1st when April starts, which is a little scary because honestly, like I, I don't know other than like, I know I'm writing articles for my mailing list. I know I'm recording podcasts, but as far as products or like things that make me money to live, I haven't got a clue. I don't know what the next thing is yet, but <laughs> I'll see soon. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Come to Asia. That would be awesome. Yeah, a friend of mine is, a friend of mine actually with a rat is docked um, somewhere in South Asia right now getting her boat repaired. And she's sending me pictures and it looks absolutely gorgeous. And her, she has a rat as well. So the rat lives on the boat. They actually brought the rat to see um, some chimpanzees that were living somewhere. And the rat didn't like the chimpanzees, which was too bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Rat is living the dream. <laughs> yeah, the the rat lives on a lives on their boat. She sails kind of around the world and teaches her kids from her boat. And they have a pet rat, <laughs> so oh, it's that's, awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, where people can find you online and learn more about you and your products, your books, and your courses? Sure. So the easiest way to find me is Google Paul Jarvis. I'm the first couple pages. It's pretty straightforward. And then if you want to read my writing, 
my newsletter that I've been talking about is the Sunday Dispatches. So the first link in Google for PJRBS um, is my Sunday Dispatches link. And that I share an article every Sunday, which makes sense because it's called the Sunday Dispatches. And a few times a year, I release a product and I tell people about it. That's the easiest way to keep in touch. All right, then. Thank you very much, Paul, for your time and for your knowledge, for your wisdom. And I, I look forward to, to reading more of your stuff and, and, and trying your products. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks. Take care. There you have it. Thank you very much for joining me today in this episode. I hope you enjoyed and learned from it as much as I did. Thank you for today's guest. Please make sure to go to Despreneur, subscribe to the email list to get updates about the upcoming episodes and inspiring stories from design, technology, and entrepreneurship fields. Subscribe to the Despreneur podcast on the iTunes and please leave an honest review. It really helps me to understand how I can improve and serve you better. It also helps other people to discover this podcast. I appreciate your time and feedback. Please let me know if you have any questions or suggestions. You can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. I love connecting with you. Thanks again, and bye until the next time.